Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, whomever they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream I had about him. Now the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified! So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene called Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes among themselves by casting lots. And then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put a charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli! Eli, lama sabachthani. That is. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. May Christ's word only be heard and Christ's word only be spoken. Amen. Beloved parishioners and friends, the elected leaders of our parish, our vestry, have just presented the drama of the passion and death of Jesus in a way that we have never experienced before. Each vestry member videoed their part at home and then all 42 elements of the passion narrative were spliced together to present to you this profound story that we hear each year on Palm Sunday. We go from the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem at the beginning of the service as we wave our palms and glorify him to this descent into the last hours of Jesus' life. Think of the contemporary examples of triumphant entries that also led to very difficult endings, especially Martin Luther King Jr. leading the people on foot to Washington, D.C., or Mahatma Gandhi on the Salt March in India, and now young Greta Thunberg a mere teenager who stood before the UN with her hair in braids. They are joined by countless others around the world whose names and faces are not known in history. They follow in Jesus' path in the sense that they know that the accolades they hear, the hosannas, can swiftly and easily turn to mocking and to violence, which is always near when the status quo is threatened. So Jesus finally comes into the great city of Jerusalem, knowing that he will die there. It's time for us to wave the palms and sing, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Remembering that the word Hosanna means save us. Time seems to slow down in this story, as anyone who has occupied spaces where death looms know that the experience of time is anything but certain. As one friend said about these last 40 days of Lent, this is the lentiest Lent that I have ever Lented. Time and emptiness can weigh heavily these days. Another friend said, what day is it? Mon Thursday on the 325th day of Mar, Mar April, May? It's in the wee hours that Jesus is arrested, a strange time when all the disciples have fallen asleep. Not one could remain awake for him. And he's taken before Pontius Pilate by soldiers for a mock trial. And now it's a time for each of us to acknowledge our part in this story, that we are all part of the crowd that says, crucify him with our hurtful language, with our lies, our daily cheating and meanness, the accusatory side of ourselves wants to find a scapegoat for our problems rather than look inwardly and work on ourselves. Today, we confront the betrayal of Jesus in which we all take part, the crown of thorns on his head, which stands for universal suffering could also be a symbol of the virus that is multiplying uncontrollably around us. Jesus carries the heavy cross, the symbol of the weight of our sins, of all our sorrows. 
He carries it all, trudging slowly through the narrow city streets, stumbling and falling, but with great courage toward his rendezvous with death. Since we started physical distancing, I walk through the church every day. I walk through the parish hall, through the school, and through the chapel, through the whole campus. And as I walk through the emptiness, I feel your presence. I feel that you are here with me, all of you who have made this your home church. And I feel the presence of those who went before us too as I pass by the montages and the ambulatory of our former rectors, past the plaque of names of those who have gone before us, loved ones who are buried in our memorial garden, where bushes and trees are flowering and becoming green again. And mostly I am aware of the presence of God here in this sanctuary. God has always been with us here at Trinity. Our legacy of faith is strong and beautiful. God has been with the people of Trinity and walked with our people through hard times before. When the physical part of being together is taken away, we have to rely more completely on the spiritual part of our being to help us get through the hard times. We remember that God's love is the foundation of who we are. God's love shown to us in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And we remember that you can't quarantine love. God's love is stronger than anything else. It's going to persist. It's going to keep spreading and keep lifting us despite illness and death. Jesus calls upon the God of life to uphold his spirit and bring him safely to eternal life. And he gives his own life that we might have life and have it more abundantly. May our God, who is the source of our life and the source of all love, abide with you in this holy week and always. Amen. <laughs>